thank you all for joining. Um, it's great to have this community back. I'm sorry we missed um, a couple of weeks where we had Christmas Eve and then we had Thanksgiving, uh, but we're back to a bi-weekly schedule for this webinar. We promise you there's always going to be great content every time. And we want to hear from you. So use that chat. Let us know where you're coming in from and share what you did on New Year's with the community. And when you do that, make sure you choose the, I don't know what it shows in Zoom these days. They keep changing the damn thing. Um, so it might say all panelists and attendees, or it might say everyone, whichever option you get, choose that so that you're sharing with the entire community of um, all the food professionals that are part of this webinar. As a reminder, we're still posting new COVID reports um, on an ongoing basis. You'll find those on the datacentralcom slash coronavirus webpage. So continue going there. Um, it's always free. It's there for the industry. We want to see the industry recover as quickly as possible. We know that this is a long-term um, movement to recovery. Uh, so we're going to continue supporting it as best we can. So look for stuff there. Just share it as much as you can. The more we share, the quicker we all move forward. And um, I thought we would maybe just as do as a reminder, if you haven't had a chance yet, we're really proud of the phenomenal, phenomenal work that Mike and his team have put together on our 2021 Trends Preview um, edition of Food Bites. It's completely free. It's part of our free newsletter. If you haven't downloaded it yet, be sure to, um, you can get it if you're a Snap user by going into Snap and clicking on uh, trend spotting inside there and you'll see you know, this is uh, among other thousands of other titles. Uh, or if you haven't subscribed to our newsletter yet, you can just go to the datacentral.com homepage at the bottom, click sign up for the newsletter and you'll get this um, automatically as well. And uh, what we're gonna be doing on the next webinar, so not today, but two weeks from today, is the special amazing super trends episode where we're gonna talk about um, really what we see as being the most important trends for this year and perhaps beyond. And Mike is gonna lead the conversation on that. And it's this is like the one that you do not wanna miss. <laughs> so January 21st, two weeks from today at noon, um, be, sure to, be sure to attend and let all of your colleagues know too. If you wanna see what the future of trends looks like, um, from the best trends person in the industry, uh, be sure to attend the next webinar on the 21st Thursday at noon central. It is our amazing trends episode and it's going to be fantastic. Um, so I know, Mike, uh, you're going to maybe just give us a, a little heads up on just some more recent things that we've seen in the news too. So we'll maybe do a few minutes and let you tell us about just what's going on in the world. Yeah, absolutely. So I think if you're paying attention to, you know, the news and newsletters that you get every day, uh, it's probably just about every day at this point that you get some type of news uh, that a major national chain is unveiling their remodel. So I know if you looked in the past couple of days, you saw Applebee's was going to um, start testing out these drive through pick up windows at their Texarkana, Texas location. And so uh, this is a little bit more interesting just because it's one of the first casual chains that has kind of really, uh, you know, is getting into this uh, drive through area. We had seen, you know, all the QSRs, all the fast casuals really, you know, going deep into drive throughs I think if you look at, we featured it on one of the previous webinars, but um, the Shake Shack remodel, um, the real estate for that location, it's almost more drive through than it is actual restaurant. And so, I, you know, I think we're getting a better idea of what the future landscape is going to look like when it comes to, you know, major national chain restaurants. Um, you know, we keep getting asked, you know, after quarantine's over, after the pandemic's over, are consumers really going to be, you know, continuing to use the drive through in the same capacity that they do right now? Uh, well, certainly the infrastructure is going to be there. I mean, when you look at all of these, you know, remodels and locations, um, it tends to be multiple drive through lanes. It tends to be, you know, a dedicated drive through lane just for the people that are ordering from an app. Um, there tends to be curbside pickup windows. You know, a lot of them have these cubbies inside. So, you know, so much of the redesigns that we're seeing kind of, um, you know, that are going to be the future of the industry are really focused on, um, you know, this really quick service model yeah. and picking things up for off-premises consumption. I, 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 I think we see a lot more of that, right? I mean, um, before it used to be like drive throughs were almost looked at as not a positive thing. And now they're being celebrated as a really cool way. And you're going to see drive through innovation, I think, as well. 
if I could just like knit at one thing that I hope <laughs> someone somewhere hears is, uh, this is maybe just a pet peeve, but sometimes you go to a drive through and like the, 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 the windows here and the curb is underneath it and the curb protrudes like way further out than the window does, which just <laughs> invites, you know, uh, like, you know, road rash or wheel rash as you rub up against the curb. And like, I'm not a tall guy, so I got like short arms. And I'm like trying to reach over to the window and that's not always <laughs> easy. If we could ergonomically design that drive through experience to just be, I don't know, ergonomically easier and minimize the risk of, you know, crashing your car against the curb. That would be <laughs> yeah, that or give, or give the folks working the drive through window one of those giant, you know, uh, pizza things that you uh, put into the brick oven so they can just give you this well, giant platform. Yeah, that's a good, yeah. They, well, they were doing that during the pandemic. They Places, I think some still do, put food on trays and sort of like tilt the tray toward you and almost slide the food or bag toward you. I'm like, oh, this is actually almost sort of easier. <laughs> so, uh, just, just an idea. What uh, if you lay? I mean, I think another thing is going to be, I mean, it's not just the issues at the drive through itself, but actually a lot of these locations are kind of still cool hangout locations. Like this is the new Slotsky's remodel. And you can see, you know, there's people that can like come up to the window for a curbside pickup. Um, I mean, you're also going to, if you're in a car, kind of be, uh, you know, kind of cognizant of all the people at the location too. If you look at the new Sonic locations, they actually have a really cool like entertainment hangout area in the front. It has cornhole and you can really like hang out there for an hour and, you know, have a slush and, and have some fun. And then at the same time, if you just want food, you know, in five minutes, just go through the drive through which I think is one of the interesting things about all these redesigns is, you know, we talked so much about segment melding in the past, but I mean, now, you know, you see a casual operator like Applebee's you know, going after those really, you know, off-premises consumption occasions. And so, you know, if you want something in five minutes, you can go to Applebee's. But then if you want to hang out, you know, for an hour after COVID is over, you can go inside and be served. And then on the other, you know, hand, like the QSRs and the fast casuals are doing the same thing, where you can go through the drive through for a five-minute pickup, or you can hang out and play cornhole. So I think we're going to see a lot more of, you know, just kind of those consumption occasions really, you know, melding between different segments. For sure. Um, here's one. Who here in chat knows who this is? Uh, just if you do, just um, say it in chat. I'm not following chat, so are we seeing a lot of activity or not much? Uh, yeah, I saw one. Only one person's got it. So oh no, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Well, now they're just copying that one person. So that's not. <laughs> really, <laughs> that's not really fair. I mean, our chatters are pretty honest. A lot of some people are saying. Okay, that we got we have honest chatters. Uh, so Mike, tell us about what's going on. Oh, I mean, did you, you love YouTube chat? Like, did you know who this was before? Like you had heard this news? I, I'm, oh yeah, I'm a, I spend probably half my life on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> and actually it'll tell you like on your device, how many hours you spend on YouTube and it tracks over time. And it's, uh, it, it really is almost like half my life. <laughs> oh my I use God. it for everything. When I'm working, <laughs> I have it on my iPad, just playing stuff all the time. Um, <laughs> so yeah, Mr. Beast um, is is awesome. Uh, he's, uh, he's got one of the biggest subscriber bases on YouTube, I think a year ago, last time I checked um, and look, he was probably at 25, 28 million subscribers. I have no idea where he is right now. But oh, I, I was, think now he's at nearly 50 million subscribers. So, yeah, two, so the two kids that came over to my house for New Year's Eve were wearing Mr. B sweatshirts. There you go. Really? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he was known I guess in the early days because he wanted to like find a way to make a viral video and he found one of the easiest way of doing it was either doing elaborate stunts uh, mm -hmm. or just giving away lots and lots of money to random strangers um, yeah. to the point where um, he just does like crazy stuff like you know I bought a private island and I'm going to give it away to someone I'm just going to donate tens of thousands of dollars at random to people on Twitch or I'm going to go into a restaurant <laughs> and just donate you know to give people a random $30,000 tip or, or something um, and I think he makes most of that back to his sponsorship. But he was also made famous, I think, um, last year because he had that big initiative where he helped plant something. I think it was 20 million. Was it 20 million or two? 20 million trees and got support from Elon Musk and some other, um, you know, uh, people in the tech world. But this is what he did recently where he opened up uh, what he called the world's first free restaurant where you would get paid to go to the restaurant. And the, the line was like a mile long 
of people mm-hmm. and you'd go to the you get to the front window and you'd get your your burgers and a bat literally a bag full of cash maybe a few hundred to ten thousand dollars depending on where you were in line you know he puts up the video instantly goes viral of course as most of his content does but that wasn't really the story right that was that video was just a launch pad for what the real story was which uh, mike you could tell us about yeah so he had done that in north carolina and like you said Huge, I mean, just absolutely huge. The line was miles long. I mean, like the amount of um, like chatter on social media was just huge. And so then at the same time, he said, you know, if you want to experience these burgers that the people coming to this restaurant get to experience, I'm simultaneously going to open 300 locations of this Mr. Beast burger restaurant across the country. So, I mean, they did cost money. It wasn't free in the same way that it was at that location. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they did it through virtual dining concepts. So it's um, the brand that actually uses existing kitchens like Buca de Beppo's um, to kind of create these ghost kitchen experiences. They did over Christmas, um, if you saw Mariah Carey's cookie pop up, um, that was the same company that did it. And so, I mean, that was successful. This was successful on another level. I mean, they saw every single burger at all 300 locations sold out within one day. I know one Buca de Beppo operator um, that was offering them said they sold something like $7,000 worth of burgers and then I think $2,000 worth of you know, other um, options uh, just in the one day. So it was super successful for those operators as well. And the way they did it is they actually looked at the YouTube viewership and they could see you know, where his biggest fans were. And so then they opened up these locations across the country where they would see his fans. And then the fans actually got together and they put together these maps to figure out where the 300 locations were, um, just because, you know, everybody was so excited to get out there and try them. Um, I think this is the type of thing that, you know, ghost kitchens can only make possible and that we're only going to continue to see more often in the future. I know Virtual Dining Concepts has said that they're going to do one with um, Pauly D, who was, um, he was the guy from... Jersey Shore guy. That Jersey says, Shore, yeah, I think he's going to do like a sub restaurant next year. So uh, I, you're just going to see a lot more of these kind of viral pop up, you know, only exist for a couple day restaurants. But it does mean, you know, the competition is going to be fierce and kind of unpredictable in the future as well. Yeah. And the whole point is, I mean, it, they were able to spawn these restaurants overnight. We talked in a, probably a few webinars ago, we talked about ghost kitchens versus virtual brands. And now we think virtual brands are going to be a big thing, you know, both because of all the success that Brinker had with its Just Wings concept. Um, this is a great example. We talked about uh, Tiger Bites um, as sort of that sort of chicken nugget concept where uh, it changes things, right? It's the operator plays a much different role in this dynamic than they do if they're just running their own menu. And you're able to basically spawn hundreds of locations uh, virtually overnight. And uh, I went on my, uh, this, this is actually a screen grab I took from my phone last night. Uh, I can still order from uh, Mr. Beast Burger in my area. So if, if you all have your phone handy, go into you know DoorDash or Uber Eats or whichever, um, app you use and just search the word beast and see if it comes up for you and maybe you know and put in on chat where you're actually um located right now and if you got a a beast hit um or not (laughs) but these uh these things are still here right i mean the fact that you can actually create a multi-hundred unit chain um like that is remarkable and the demand is driven by all this sort of non-restaurant offline viral social media like activity or the world of celebrity is a totally different way of thinking about marketing and what makes for a successful restaurant. I think you're gonna see a lot more virtual brands in 2021, many of them from chains that wanna do things with excess kitchen capacity, um, for instance. And a lot of them could end up looking you know, like this. And check out way. that disclaimer too, You know where they're disclosing that it's made in a local kitchen, uh, yep. you know, because that's one thing we saw too, is that consumers are, they're, I mean, they're cool with this idea, um, but more of them than I thought uh, were demanding some transparency in all of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, this is a bit of a game changer. I mean, I know it's sort of silly to talk about like one YouTube guy, but I think this whole thing is a bit of a game changer for, for the industry. But uh, I think that's the thing too, even is that, I mean, even if you don't know who Mr. Beast is, 
that, I mean, all of these types of ghost kitchens can kind of cater to these really niche audiences. So even if, you know, you don't order from the Mr. Beast restaurant, at some point in the future, there's going to be some ghost kitchen pop-up restaurant that speaks to, you know, whatever tribe you're a part of. If one of yeah. these Minecraft YouTubers opens up a restaurant, my son's going to be all over me to order from <laughs> You know, there's a great quote, and I don't know where it came from, but it really just describes sort of where we are and what the future is really well, which is, you know, we're moving from a society with, you know, of, made of hundreds of groups, each with millions of members, to a society with millions of groups, each with only hundreds of members. And how do you do that if you're a restaurant? Well, you do things like a limited time restaurant that appeals to that very targeted, devoted, fanatical, and perhaps niche group, and then you move on to the next one instead. You know, you don't have to do, build brick and, brick and mortar from scratch. Uh, anymore. Um, Mike, what do we have here? And just really quick, this is actually something that Jacqueline on our team found because she's putting together our issue of Dine Around that looks at um, new Midwestern restaurants and openings. Um, and so this is Parachute here in Chicago, one of the best restaurants in Chicago, Michelin starred. Um, and she was looking at their menu and she actually saw that they were doing this. They call it the little P menu, which is like the little parachute menu for if you have babies or kids at home. So they actually make baby food. It's seasonal baby food. You can see it there. I think there's a pumpkin version in there. Um, all of the proceeds, or I think um, some of the proceeds go to an organization that supports single moms in the hospitality industry. So um, I think it's just interesting what's happening right now that, you know, so many restaurants are discovering kind of the, um, you know, life issues that people are having at home right now. You know, normally, you know, Parachute is catering to that audience that's going to come in, they're going to spend a few hours, they're going to drop a few hundred bucks, and they probably leave their kids at home with a babysitter. Whereas now they can't do that. So Parachute really has to figure out how to cater, you know, to that family. And, uh, you know, so they're making baby food right now. Uh, I think we're yeah. going to see a lot more in the future of these restaurants that have pivoted and created new opportunities. Just continue to do it. Yeah, you got to do it. And it's sort of inspirational, right? I mean, there was a time when before it's like, hey, if I offer, you know, my signature sauce in a bottle at my restaurant, that was considered, you know, really innovative. But we're past that now. Now we're looking at things like this that really get to much more specific needs. And hopefully we see a lot more of that. I didn't, you know, if you're, if you're on the operator side of things, we would certainly encourage you to just, you know, play with these creative ideas. Uh, there's a need for these in the marketplace. Um, well, thanks, Mike. I think, Mike, if you could sort of stick around and yeah, uh, sure. Absolutely. add some thoughts uh, and maybe prayers, <laughs> <laughs> depending on the content as, as we go through the rest of the hour, that would be great. And just again, as a reminder, please chat, let us know what you think and use that all panelists and attendees or everyone, it might say everyone, option to make sure um, you're sharing with everybody. So I guess I'd love to hear what you all think in chat. How are you feeling about the food industry in 2021? So we made it out of 2020. Um, it may or may not feel like we've made it out of 2020 today, but we've made it out of 2020. How are you feeling about this year? Do you think we're going to see a lot of positivity? Do you think it's going to be a lot more of the same? Um, tell us what you think, and I'll share at the same time what Data Central's projections are for 2021 uh, and how that lines up with what we saw in 2020. So here's the short of it. Um, last year, we saw uh, roughly, and I think these numbers held up pretty well, this is our initial forecast, um, a 28% decline in food service, let's say business, or dollars spent uh, in 2020. Um, we see a partial recovery in 2021. Uh, of course, many, many things could happen that could change that number, but we're projecting about a 7.5% increase over that 2020 baseline. Uh, and of course, as you can imagine, this is not a one size fits all type of thing. It really depends on the segment that you're in, right? So certain segments were hit harder in 2020 and certain segments are gonna recover more quickly in 2021. Um, and here's sort of what we see. So I don't know if anything jumps out at you, uh, Mark or Mike that makes you go, oh, that's sort of interesting, but it really does make sense, right? You know, colleges and business cafeterias and travel all really got decimated last year. You know, full service restaurants, certainly more so than limited service ones. Um, but you can see which segments we think you can start recovering a little more quickly, right? So CNU is still going to be challenged in 21, but should improve at a faster rate than other segments over the 2020 baseline, as an example. QSR, which held up really quite well in 2020, we think will actually continue to improve even more in 21 versus other types of restaurants, for instance. 
Um, you know, Jack, why not? Why not fast casual? I would I would have guessed that fast casual might have had, you know, more of a of a higher projection, um, just because they've been they've yeah. been really increasing uh, rate at which they open their restaurants during the pandemic. I would have thought that they would have had more of a tailwind from their unit growth. It might be. I think a lot of it has to do with uh, how well they are set up uh, for digital. Frankly, I mean, if you think about the QSR versus the fast casual experience, a lot of it, it goes back to that first thing Mike showed us with like that drive through that they're trying to build at, at Applebee's, right? You know, their the drive through is intrinsic to QSR and is sometimes there for fast casual. Mm -hmm. um, so that that is a big piece of it. But, you know, some brands like Chipotle and others that have done a really great draw, job with digital are driving a ton of, of, of you know, of revenue through that. And if you're a brand that's done a good job with it, then you'll probably have a pretty good 21 as well. Um, so there's a lot of factors, but I think QSR is still generally favored, especially in the current climate where, as we'll see right in a, in a few slides, uh, people are still a little freaked out um, given the current wave that we're in. Hey, there's a good question here, Jack. Um, those projections, are those based, those are based from uh, comparing 2021 to 2020, not 2019 yes. base? Yes, yeah. So the 2021 is compared to 2020. So, um, so if, if you do the quick math, you're seeing that we're not generally predicting that things get back fully to 2019 levels yet in 21. They'll be certainly better than 2020 was, uh, but we think it's more of a partial recovery this year than a full recovery. And if you're interested in playing with these numbers a little bit more, um, we actually helped design this really wonderful tool that you could get from uh, IFMA, uh, Internet, the International Food Service Manufacturers Association. If you go to www.ifmaworld.com, at the top of the page, there's a thing that's called IFMA scope that you could click on. And this is what we call the landscape, where you could look at everything you want to know on a segment by segment basis, what it looked like last year, what we think next year is going to look like, plus about 50 other stats that you could choose and customize on your screen. Uh, we built this in collaboration with a company called Kinetic 12 for IFMA and, um, and its members, as well as the general public, and it's a great resource. So uh, definitely use it. You can find it at ifmaworld.com. So um, maybe we we'll just want to ask you all a question as our first poll of the year. When do you think uh, restaurants and other small businesses will basically be back to 100% um, capacity? Um, so when will they be allowed to be open at a hundred percent? Uh, and Mike, Mark, I don't think you're going to bias things too much. If you offer up your opinion, uh, I can say over here, it seems like it keeps changing. I'm here in Williamson County, which is right outside of Nashville and things feel like they're open at hundred percent, but I think technically, technically it's only like 50, 60, 70 or something. But I'm not really feeling that restriction so much. Then you have, you know, places like LA where you don't have indoor or outdoor dining. Uh, what do you think, like for the country as a whole? You know, most places are really back to 100% capacity. If you had to place your bets, I would I would guess 2022, just because I think it will take a long time for those big metros like Los Angeles, New York, San Francisco to get all the way back. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, I said 2022 as well. I think, I mean, I, before I might have been a little bit more um, optimistic, but it just seems like the vaccine rollout is going to take a lot longer than we thought it might. So, um, yeah, I mean, it seems like your timelines aren't that different than what the, you know, the community of people on this webinar think. So not many people think it's happening in the first, well, there's one person in that zero percent. There's one very, very optimistic person, and God bless you. Uh, who thinks it's going to happen in the next couple of months? But for the most part, people think it's going to be, you know, fourth quarter or maybe even bleeding into uh, next year. But uh, we'll see. You know, hopefully we do a better job with vaccine distribution in the periods ahead, and and that makes a difference. But uh, yeah, there's still a number of unknowns. No. So we've seen some interesting headlines um, over the you know, past several months, and I wanted to maybe just recap a few of these. You know. You know, restaurant closings top 110,000. You know, I, I think this is maybe an NRA number. Uh, I believe this one 
came from Monterey, but you've probably seen a lot of these types of headlines, right? You know, over 110,000 restaurants have already closed and the industry's in free fall. Um, here's another uh, published headline that says 85% of independent restaurants uh, are, you know, may or may be likely to go out of business. They've seen other ones that say, you know, half of restaurants, uh, you know, half of independent restaurants have already closed. There's like a whole lot of numbers floating around out there. And we wanted to maybe just um, add some clarity to all this and show you what the real numbers uh, actually are, and then maybe make a, an informed guess as to how these numbers are gonna evolve in the periods ahead. So have half, have half of all restaurants closed? Uh, no, I mean, you can sort of tell this by just driving in your neighborhood. Does it look like half the restaurants that used to be there are now gone? Probably doesn't look like that. You know, Maybe if you live in a very specific place, but generally speaking, it doesn't look like that. And and we used our Firefly data, uh, database to really sort of do this analysis. So Firefly is basically a data, our universal operator database. It has every place that serves food in the country, every restaurant, hotel, you know, grocery store, hospital, you name it, um, down at the unit level. And we can track this over time and look at things like restaurant openings and closures now on even like a weekly basis. And here's what we found. So I'm going to show you some stats we've shown in some of the previous webinars with the closures we've seen for restaurants that existed prior to COVID. So sort of like we're using March 11th as our like COVID, you know, cutoff date. I know, you know, COVID had been floating around before then, but like March 11th, that time frame was really sort of like D-Day in a way. Um, so of restaurants that are open on March 10th, you know, how many have closed? since then. And on May 6th, you could see that about 12% of all restaurants were closed, most of those temporary closures. And then as time marched on, the temporary closures started going down and the permanent closures started inching up. Um, so we just uh, looked at our latest data from the end of December. So literally just a few days ago. And the question is, what do the numbers look like now? And here they are, um, temporary closures, have continued to decline. They're down about two and a half percent, but we've seen a pretty large spike in permanent closures. We've gone from 5% of those pre-COVID restaurants to being totally permanently closed to that number almost doubling between the September 23rd and the end of December. We're now at about 9.2%. So we're basically at this point, and we sort of were able to predict this where the financial hardship would you know, be so much that those operators that were just trying and trying and trying to make it and just doing what they can and busting their asses every day, at some point they just couldn't make it anymore. So it does feel like we're at a point where there's some financial stress uh, or a pretty significant amount of financial stress on those restaurants. And it could be a breaking point for a number of them. Typically independence though, is what we're seeing. So that's what it looks like right now. And if you take those numbers, right, the two and a half percent that are temporarily closed, the 9.2% that are permanently closed, and the 11.6% in total that are closed right now, um, here's what it equals on a unit basis. So about 69,000 or so permanent closures of pre-COVID restaurants, uh, about 18, 19,000 permanent temporary closures, and about 88,000 in total that have been closed. So um, you know, not quite as high as that 110,000 number that you know has been shared a little bit. Uh, certainly nowhere near as high as the 50 or 70 or 85 percent closure numbers that you've seen as headlines to. The number is about 12 percent, right? 11.6 percent, about 88,000 restaurants so far. Hopefully, many of those 19,000 that are temporarily closed will eventually reopen. But the longer time draws on, the more likely it is that many of those will become permanent closures at some point. So, you know, restaurant closures in actuality have lagged the numbers that we've seen, the really alarming numbers we've seen in the headlines. Um, so that's good news. But you could see an acceleration of closures in the early parts of 21 because so many restaurants, especially those smaller independents that really need our help and support, uh, are at a financial breaking point. And you may remember early on, we sort of said, hey, every restaurant is just so focused on getting you know, the top line in, getting any business they can through their door, uh, at some point they're gonna have to start looking at their bottom line. If they're only doing delivery and they're paying a commission to the marketplace and they're selling primarily entrees and they're not selling as much appetizers and sides and beverages that they make more money on that are more profitable because those food costs are lower, 
there's going to be a real strain on the bottom line. So um, if you're a supplier to the industry, you want to find a way to help those operators um, maintain the margins they need to at the end of the day. The bottom line will be more important than the top line in the period ahead if those places are going to stay open. And Jack, so, there's a question from the audience. Um, of those 69,000 or so that are permanently closed, can you ballpark the split between independent and, and chain? Do we know that um, off the top of our head? Uh, so someone in chat might. So if anyone on our Firefly team is in chat and super fast and would care to maybe look that number up and reply via chat, that would be good. We're gonna, we'll consult the Oracle and hopefully the Oracle answers uh, in chat. <laughs> And the Oracle also remembers to choose all panelists and attendees when posting your, your reply. So, uh, so let it be written, so let it be done. So let it be done, yeah. So, uh, but we can take a look on a cuisine basis as what's closed right now. So if you look at the percentage of restaurants of each of these different types of cuisines, what percentage of them are actually closed, uh, it's no surprise, buffets continue to be the most closed type of place. And, uh, you know, Thai places and bagel places, they were the, the least closed places. The last time I looked at this, they continue to be the least closed places now. What becomes interesting is if you actually look at what's happened between the end of September and the end of December, right? So how many more places have closed of each of these types of, how many more restaurants of each of these different types of cuisines have closed um, during the, what, September, during that three month gap? From the end of September to the end of December. And we sort of sorted this by the places that had the most additional closures on a percentage basis um, during those three months. And you know, even though buffets were the most closed type of restaurant um, at the end of September, um, they continued to almost lead the pack in the most additional closures even since September through the end of um, this most recent year. Uh, they went from 20% closed at the end of September to almost 28% December. And you can see um, there's some interesting sort of patterns over here too, where it's not all even, right? Um, you're seeing different breaking points for different types of restaurants. And there are other factors too, right? The, not just the menu type, but also the segment they fall in. Uh, and perhaps the most important factor is physically where they're located, because we know that the specific neighborhood you're in and whether people have just been sucked out of that neighborhood because they're no longer going to the big office buildings there, that's the single biggest factor um, of all. And what complicates things is, you know, downtown areas are more likely to have certain types of restaurants than our rural areas, right? If you want, um, you know, great Indian food, you're probably not going to get it in a rural community. You're probably going downtown and you might be going downtown in a place where a lot of the people are just no longer there. Um, for instance. So uh, this will be available to you if you want to download the deck following uh, the webinar. We never, we'll probably have this posted, if not tomorrow, by Monday at the latest for download. And, you know, another way of thinking about this is if you look at all the restaurants that have closed um, during COVID, uh, what is the share of different menu types within that? So basically, of all the uh, 88,000 restaurant closures that we've seen, about 19% of those restaurant closures were very many places. And you could see that 8% were coffee and tea and 10% were sandwich and deli places. Uh, but interestingly, 11% were pizza restaurants, right? Which is actually quite notable because we said early on, and this proved to be quite true, that you know, pizza would be a great beneficiary of COVID because it's so delivery friendly but it's also one of the types of places that's closed the most. Now there's a lot of pizza restaurants to begin with, mm -hmm. but it's not as though every pizza restaurant did enormously well during COVID. Some did great. And some of those legacy pizza brands or the big pizza chains have done really well, but other pizza places didn't and actually got to the point where they just had to close, which says something that a lot of this is sort of um, in control of the operator. Right? You do have control over your own destiny as to how you choose to execute a menu, what you want to do for marketing, how you go about this, right? The, how quickly you're able to, to pivot plays a big role. You know, your future is not necessarily preordained just because you're a pizza place. You're not necessarily just going to be automatically successful. Just as if you are a buffet, you're not necessarily doomed by nature. There are things that you can do. Um, so these questions have sort of swirled and you've seen headlines like this, like, hey, 
more than half of New York's restaurants are in danger of closing. Uh, and then there's a, this is a headline that I sort of like. It says, no one knows how many restaurants have closed in New York City. I feel like this is a false headline because I know exactly how many restaurants have closed in New York City. <laughs> and now you do too. So we had to go back to whichever publication this is from and have them correct the headline. And, and here you go. So we look at New York City and we look specifically at the five boroughs. Um, here's what it looks like. And um, if you look at the closure rates, it's certainly higher here than it is nationally, right? We're looking like 11.5% nationally um, here uh, for New York City as a whole. It's like 17% but it's driven primarily by an outsized 24% in Manhattan, right? So that's, that's the big number there. And in Manhattan alone, the rate of permanent closures exceeds the rate of total closures nationally. Um, one in six restaurants is now permanently gone in Manhattan. So uh, the answer to the question, how many restaurants have closed in New York City? 3,989 as of December. 28th. Now, New York City is just one part of the larger New York metro area. And we can see where the New York metro is, 13.4% closure, and how that ranks among the most closed metros versus the most open metros across the US. So this is um, the percentage of all restaurants in each one of these metropolitan areas that are now closed, right, as a result of COVID, or no, I should say that, that, that I've closed since COVID began. There could be other reasons that you've, that you've closed. Um, and, you know, there's a pretty big difference between the areas on the left and the areas on the right. So Honolulu, Austin, San Francisco, Traverse City, Las Vegas, et cetera. Um, those are among the most closed. Among the most open are a lot of those places on the right. And I actually have to say, like, I could tell you, I think, um, every single state that each one of these cities or metros on the left falls in. I don't know if I know every single state that every one of the places on the right falls in. Like some of these are places I just uh, am not as familiar with, right? Uh, like I'm not exactly sure where Rockford is, sadly. Uh, I'm probably too embarrassed to mention some of the other ones I'm not entirely Sure about well, that. Maybe Rockford, Illinois, about. like right, right near here. Yeah, uh, right <laughs> maybe. Right I, I don't know. Uh, I'm, being, I'm being honest, but I there can is get there in like half an hour. <laughs> and if you look at the numbers, right, generally the number of restaurants tends to be higher in those most closed metros on the left, right? The bigger metros tend to be a little bit more closed, or in some cases, a lot more closed than some of the ones on the right, which only have a thousand or two thousand restaurants on average. So here's a question for you all. Uh, you ever do like one of those games as a kid where you get like a big jar of like jelly beans, you have to guess how many jelly beans are in the jar oh, yeah. or something. So we'll do our version of that. So in chat, and again, chat to everyone, please. Uh, who wants to venture a guess as to how many new restaurants have opened since uh, our D-Day uh, COVID date of March 11th, 2020? How many brand new restaurants have opened for the very first time, not reopenings, but grand openings, you know, initial first time opening the doors. How many of those have, how many times has that happened since March 11th, 2020? Uh, I'm curious to see. I mean, this is actually an interesting thing because this is a very hard number to guess. There's no context for it. So you might get like really wild guesses spanning all sorts of things. Uh, what so, are we seeing? So wildly yeah. low guesses. We're seeing, we're seeing a lot of guesses that are fewer than a thousand. Well, yeah, it's uh, wild okay. swings. I mean, there's like 100s, 200s, all the way up to like. 30, what's what's 000, the biggest one that we've seen so far? Mm, I think I saw 100, one six digit. 150,000. Yeah. Okay, so that's a pretty big range from 100 to 150,000. Uh, <laughs> so here's the actual number it's about 12, uh, not 12, 12,000. 11,884 is the precise number. And of those that have opened during that time, the vast majority are still open. There haven't been that many places that opened up during COVID and said, oh, we can't do this anymore. And since shut down, 98% of those 11,894 are still open. And if you look at the types of restaurants that have opened up, so in this graph on the bottom, you can see the number of units of each of those menu types. It's been a lot of pizza places that have opened. They're almost 20% of what's open. 
And then you can see which segments they represent too. So you can see the share of openings. And then there's an index next to it, which says, are they opening at a faster rate than they exist than they existed in the wild uh, pre-COVID? So you're right, Mark. Uh, fast casuals are actually opening up more quickly um, than you normally expect. QSRs are also op opening up more quickly, quickly than you normally expect. Uh, but fine dining restaurants are really, really few and far between in terms of brand new openings, which makes total sense given the yeah. environment. If you look at it by cuisine type, though, it's 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 interesting, and I can't quite figure it out because uh, you know, for instance, wing restaurants and Thai restaurants are kind of just they're they're in the middle there, doing fine, but um, you know they were weathering the closures much much better. Yep. And then you see, uh, you know, I, I see ice cream and froyo has, they're on the kind of the left side of the spectrum there with a lot of openings. You, you know, I, I'm wondering if are a lot of these different cuisine types just kind of ending up around kind of an equilibrium that you can expect the market to bear in, in a normal time you know, here? I think so. I think there's also a thing about, um, I mean, there's a chain independent split. There's also a thing about, was this a, a business decision or was it a human decision, right? Even mm -hmm. like an Indian or a Thai restaurant, it's typically a family run type of place. It's a true independent with just one unit. If you're mm -hmm. going to do it, you're going to do it. Like you might say, oh, now is not a good time or now is a good time and, and you open or you don't. Uh, but you're making that as a human decision. Like you're like, there's nothing else I want to do in life. I just want to open my restaurant. Uh -huh. right? If you're, you know, a chain or let's say a pizza chain, you may be making a business decision about, you know, do I want to expand? right now. And that might be a little bit more sensitive to what's happening in you know, the world in terms of you know, financial and traffic and, and all that. So I, I think there's probably a little bit of that going on is, is my guess. Yeah, I can't wait to look at, if once we get it someday, the, the franchise data. You know, if, if you could look at how many of these are franchise versus, versus not, I'm guessing that the, on the left side there, some of these cuisine types with a lot of unit growth probably are among, you know, maybe new franchise openings. Yeah, it's it's certainly possible. Uh, we could look at it at a brand level too, and uh, that may be something we investigate for one of these future webinars. Uh, so here's another way of looking at this. This is how many restaurants, so 11,884 openings over the course of the year. Um, here's January through November. We don't have a final, final December number yet, so I'm excluding it from this particular chart, but here's how many openings we had each month of 2020, right? Things sort of started dropping off a cliff in February, really fell off a cliff in March and April, and then started to recover a little bit. But then as we got into this current wave or spike, we saw a real slowdown in openings in November, and we saw another slowdown in openings in December as well. And the question is, how does this compare to what a normal year of restaurant openings would look like? So here's that same chart, but we've added on top of it uh, these gray columns, which show the number of new restaurant openings by month in 2019 as a comparison. So we actually started off 2020 already for whatever reason, who knows, um, could be a number of things, a little bit slower than we normally would um, compared to the prior year. And then you can see just the degree of drop that we've had in new restaurant openings versus what an otherwise normal year would have been, right? Like April was just way lower, like, you know, for, instead of three or 4,000 openings, we only had 600. And then again, November is, way lower than what, let's say, our prior year number was. On average, though, restaurants opened up at about one quarter the rate um, last year as they would have in a normal year. Um, and we expect that number to pick up in 21, uh, but we've got to make it through this first wave, you know, this current wave that we're not first, so this current wave that we're in right now. So I think a lot of restaurants are saying, you know, it'd be sort of crazy to open up right now when I'm told that I can't even be open in some cases. So the question is, what does this look like for 2021? And uh, this is probably not the merriest 2021 banner, but uh, you know, <laughs> what, what do things look like in the periods ahead? Well, you know, look, there's a lot of talk about you know hospitalizations being up. Here's a, a map of ICU bed um, occupancy. When the dots get big and red, that gets you know much, much, much worse. And there's lots of red dots and some pretty big dots too. So we have some concerns there. And as a result, those tracking measures that we look at, um, as of a couple of days ago, uh, people are still pretty on edge. 60% saying they're very concerned about coronavirus. We're still at that pretty elevated level right now. And about almost 50% saying, I'm definitely avoiding eating out. 
So uh, we'd hope to see this number drop, um, and I think it will. Uh, but we're st basically stabilized right now. There's been no real change from where we were a month ago. Uh, about half people saying I'm still avoiding eating out. And so I would ask all of you in chat if you could share, you know, are you changing your food behavior at all based on the recent COVID spike? Right? Given, you know, everything that you're seeing with hospitalizations and bed capacity and all the new cases, have you changed the way you're getting or eating food at all specifically in response to that? Is it in the back of your mind looming? And if so, how? Uh, so Mark, I think you have some stats you want to share with us from some new consumer work we just completed. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and a lot of this is going to be coming out in the next COVID report, which uh, ideally will get out uh, tomorrow up on the website for everybody. Um, you know, and the context here is that this is all happening in the context of the bad news about, uh, you know, hospitalizations and the good news about vaccines coming. So it's it's this, you know, very interesting tension, right? We We sort of feel like we might be at the beginning of the end. Uh, but we got to make it to the end, you know, as safely as we can. And so that's really uh, going to start, um, you know, really put, putting more emphasis on an at-home food occasion um, and an off-premise strategy for the restaurant operators. So uh, pretty good uh, growth in, you know, cooking at home, uh, getting groceries to do that, um, and then, you know, using these off-premise methods from the restaurants. Uh, you know, one thing that is interesting to me is kind of this deceleration in uh, getting meal kits delivered uh, to our homes for cooking at home. Um, but I think that might be uh, related to what we'll see in a little bit when we talk about resolutions for eating more healthfully and, and saving money. Uh, you know, sometimes that stuff doesn't either fit into your uh, kind of diet plan or your budget. Uh, we did ask a couple of, of different questions here where, um, you know, rating your agreement uh, about how things have been, uh, you know, going the last couple of months here, especially as it relates to uh, restaurant shutdowns, uh, and a, a bare majority think that you know the the shutdown orders that we're seeing from either state governments uh, or you know uh, federal government trying to kind of influence that uh, a little bit more than half of us just sort of don't agree with that. We think that the responsibility kind of should lay with the consumer rather than with the business owner. And to me, I think that's salient because. Um, in this last survey from which this is all drawn, uh, the concern for the public health crisis uh, compared with the economic crisis, if you had to pick two, uh, it's about 60-40 public health crisis. So, you know, we're cognizant of, you know, that's a really big problem, but people tend to think that, well, it's, it's on me to keep myself safe and, and to solve for that. It's you know, close next... to a 50-50 split, though. It's not really severely in, in one direction, right? There's definitely disagreement. Over here. Yeah, it's not it's not nearly as cut and dry as the uh, the next one we'll see. And I'm sorry for my garage door, everybody. Um, my office is right above the garage, and so this this happens sometimes. They say low buzz is good for your health, right? It helps. Yeah. You. Okay, <laughs> that, that should be it. <laughs> um, and here's another stat where you have a much more aggressive agreement. Yeah, there there really is. Um, I think a, a a much wider recognition. Uh, that the restaurant industry has been hit especially hard in a very specific way. Um, and this, this goes back to one thing about consumers where they certainly don't blame restaurants for, you know, the fact that, you know, kind of the risk of spread is, in, is inherent to them. You know, restaurants exist to be gathering places. It's dangerous to gather. Um, you know, a lot of people from the, you know, NRA and other you know, organizations, organizations that advocate for this industry, you know, they're, they're saying that, you know, look, uh, you know, we're, they're feeling kind of unfairly targeted by some of these, these rules and these restrictions, but the consumers don't really see it that way. You know, consumers don't really see uh, restaurants as at fault here. Um, and I think that's one reason why they recognize the need for a specific aid package for them. Yeah, and I think for any, uh, probably many of you know better than the, than I do or, or we do, but uh, that specific aid doesn't exist, right? There was no special carve out just for restaurants in the stimulus bill. It's just part of the general, you know, PPP or or general fund, in some way. So right, you know, it wasn't it wasn't for lack of trying. I mean, there there was a I think it was a hundred and twenty billion dollar package just for the restaurant industry, 
uh, that was proposed, but did not get uh, approved by a vote. Yeah. yeah. So how do people feel about the future as we move past 2020 and go into 21? Is this uh, a representation of the way people see it? Um, I actually like this picture that was chosen. To me, this, this person's face says, I am cautiously optimistic. Not definitely optimistic, but cautiously optimistic. Is that maybe how you characterize things? Yeah, I, I would I would say so. I mean, those those hands look a little bit more folded in prayer <laughs> than. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it is a healthy number, though, right? Two thirds of consumers are are optimistic for the for the new year. Uh, but mm -hmm. I'd say it is again with some caution. You can see the numbers change a bit depending on the generation. And Mark, we ask people, you know, if you're optimistic, why are you optimistic about twenty one? Well, I mean, I think a lot of the options that you see here on the screen have a lot to do with that second one, which is half of us are, you know, hopeful and confident that we're going to get the pandemic more under control soon. Um, you know, this was fielded a little bit before some of the more recent news where, you know, the, the vaccine rollout, um, it's, it's a little bit bumpier than we would have hoped, but uh, we are pinning our optimism on the fact that once you get the virus under control, then you're allowed to see your family. You're allowed to go out and you know do more things that you uh, you know were hoping to get back to. And at the bottom of this list, we're you know we're a little bit more um, you know tepid in our feelings about what our prospects are, kind of either at work or getting you know a new job. You know, and then toward the bottom there, you know, not too many people think that we're going to be less polarized over things like like politics and. I'd have to imagine that'll go down after yesterday. So um, we're more focused on getting the virus under control and then basically what that lets us do in terms of seeing people again. Yeah. And uh, resolutions, uh, I would almost ask if, if, if you and Chad are willing to share, what were your resolutions? But we could tell you what people say they made for their resolutions this year. And mm -hmm. I guess I was maybe a little surprised. Uh, I don't know. That, uh, that health and weight loss, again, top the list. I would have maybe thought that this would be the one year where it gets knocked off its top perch by something else, but no, it's still there at the top as it is almost every year. Yeah, if, if that could just be kind of the function of, of where we are um, you know, in the calendar of the pandemic. I mean, after 10 months of this, maybe you start feeling like, okay, yeah, you, you, gotta, you gotta make some changes, you know, breaks over, you kind of milked the, the pandemic for for a while in terms of being you know kind to yourself um but uh you know the the, the being more healthy and uh saving money uh improving finances these are always at the top every year um and so i you know i it didn't surprise me so much that they that they were at the top again um yeah. you know i'll say one more time that at the bottom of the list more is is a uh, just a little bit less uh, around our prospects for for uh, work. I think that we probably need to wait and see a little bit more about how the first part of the year shakes out before we can really start to, you know, make those plans again. Yeah, and you know, interesting about uh, eating well. One, I think the, the latest stat is now seventy three percent of people are overweight or obese, which is up mm -hmm. from like the mid sixties number that. We last saw, so it's still increasing at an alarming rate. Then you have all these people who say, I want to lose weight. And normally what happens is there's a rush of gym memberships in January and everyone goes to the gym for like two or three weeks and then just stops. But you can't go to the gym right now. So what happens this year? I actually don't know what that means. Is it just, you know, Peloton stock keeps going up? I, uh, what does that actually mean in a year where you don't have a gym in January? It's an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. So some changes to eating behavior too, or plans on uh, change, plan changes. Uh, what do we see, Mark? Well, we, we see this with, with healthful eating, not just in this survey, but really in a, in a couple of different things that we've asked over the years, you know, whether it's for one of our keynotes on a, on a, on a menu category or, or things like that. Health usually tends to be um, about kind of cutting back on the bad stuff or adding, adding the good stuff. Um, for this one, uh, I think that our, our plans so far in 2021 
Um, it's a little bit flipped. Usually we see more about people making the effort to add good things to their diet. And right now we're seeing more people um, kind of cutting out uh, perceived bad stuff out of their diet. Uh, and then on the topic of vaccines, so latest numbers, two thirds say I'm, I plan on getting a vaccine number for, I don't know why the number is higher for men than for women. I just don't know what the, that dynamic is, but you could see that among people that are very concerned about COVID, they're super likely to say they'd get the vaccine. And then for the people that don't care as much, eh, you know, not nearly as likely, but still about a third of them still they'll get the vaccine anyways, I guess, just because, you know, why not, why not do it? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it can't hurt. And I think that that's, that's one place where the message is getting through where, um, you know, it's not just about safeguarding yourself. It's about safeguarding other people around you from you, if yep. you happen to be, you know, COVID positive, symptomatic or not. Yeah. And uh, what are people looking forward to once they get vaccinated? Well, the really good thing for, for our industry is that, you know, the, the thing that we seem to miss the most, um, aside from just seeing our friends, is going out with them. And we typically go out to restaurants, to the movies, uh, travel, we want to, you know, travel wants to come back as well. So uh, the, the good news about our industry right now, it's bad because inherently we're gathering places, not allowed to gather. But as soon as we get the all clear, we're probably one of the first places that people want to go. Do you think we can get something like a vaccine card or a vaccine passport or some, you know, confirmation thing? Is that going to end up happening or is that, or is that something that our society doesn't you know, follow? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I already, I already, you know, go to a couple places, you know, in their retail settings, but, you know, they basically just have that thing where you, you know, you look at some tablet and it'll, you know, kind of scan your face, take your temperature and give you green or red, you know, like if you're all good, it's green and you can go in. I guess it's not that different. Um, and we see uh, following up on the number two thirds say once they're vaccinated, they plan on visiting restaurants more often. And 19% say they're going to visit restaurants right away um, as soon as they get vaccinated, you know, more often than they did before. And this is most prominent among millennials. Gen Xers and men for some reason, and less common among that boomer population. So you'll see a bit more of a lag if your traditional audience is boomers. Um, once they get vaccinated, you probably don't expect a wave of them to just rush right back through your doors. But if you're typically going after millennials and Gen X and that's your audience, you'll probably see a more quick, uh, you know. Interesting, because that, that's the population that is likely to get vaccinated first. You know, they're, they're sort of prioritized for it. Yeah, so it may all even out in the end in, in some way. Um, and then finally, as we wrap up the hour, there are some new habits that have been formed as a result of COVID that will likely continue going forward. And uh, Mark, maybe you can tell us about some of these. Well, yeah, I mean, a, a lot of these are, the, these are ones that have been consistently, uh, you know, the, the most common. We've, we've asked this a couple of different times throughout the pandemic. Uh, and so really hand washing um, and social distancing, those are ones that are um, moderate to low effort to kind of keep yourself safe. And so that's why we can, we can see that they're gonna have a lot more staying power. Um, even at the bottom of this list though, you know, half of us- are Yeah. yeah they're still big numbers. Yeah, definitely. You know, half of us shopping for food online more than we had uh, before the pandemic, you know, that that's across grocery delivery, um, you know, getting restaurant meals delivered, meal kits. Uh, so this was probably going to happen, you know, anyway, over a long time frame. The pandemic definitely accelerated it. And I just think that we see it, it's going to have more staying power, um, you know, than, than you might have thought. And given that we've been doing this for nearly a year now, a lot of this is ingrained behavior. I mean, it's, it's truly habitual, probably at some point. Maybe, yeah. maybe some people, you know, Okay, maybe mask is not the thing. Although some people might continue wearing masks in the long run because they just got used to it. But some of these things may be real ingrained behaviors. It's not like we just did it for two weeks and stopped. It's yeah. been for a long time. Well, I mean, um, someone made the comment in the in the comments here earlier that you know they were watching a movie on New Year's Eve with their kids, and their kids like, why are those folks not wearing masks? Yeah. So, if if, yeah, if I'm yeah, watching this something is... on TV and I see like two characters hug or shake hands, I'm like, ooh, what just happened? It it feels awkward to even see that in, in some strange way. So yeah, compared with like some dramas now have like, there's a, there are a couple of like courtroom dramas on CBS where like they have the plexiglass, you know, yeah. up, you yeah. know, 
in the show. And then every football game, the coach is wearing a mask, you know, under his headset. I've gotten used to watching uh, basketball with the way they have the thing set up. It's I'm sort of used to seeing it without people now. It's just like yeah. you, you get used to stuff again after you do it for a while. Totally. Um, and uh, hopefully you're all getting used to this uh, webinar and you'll continue to join us week after week. Uh, because the next one, actually, actually, every, two weeks after two weeks, because our next one is in two weeks. It is the one you do not want to miss. I hope you will all raise your, I don't know if it's your left hand or your right hand, your hand of your hand of greater preference and swear that you will invite one of your colleagues to join as well. If they go to the datacentral.com homepage, there's a place we could sign up for the webinar. Uh, the next one is gonna be Mike taking us through the most amazing and important trends of 21. And you totally don't wanna miss this one. So amazing trends episode, Thursday, January 21st, 12 p.m. Central. And as always, thank you all so much. Uh, you made our lives uh, and our last year a heck of a lot better just being able to spend time with you. And uh, we're looking forward to doing a lot more of that this year as well. Um, thanks, everybody. And uh, Mike, Mark, if uh, you wanted to stick around for a second while we close out. Yeah, totally. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, year, year two here was was something. Today today is my anniversary of starting at Data Essential. And <laughs> the last 12 months, man. I feel like longer than 12 months. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, it's funny. It's, uh, you know, once we get off this, I'm... You know, probably gonna check news headlines, and I'm, I'm like, is there gonna be something else crazy that has happened in the last yeah, right. hour? Uh, hour, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that, <laughs> that definitely happened yesterday. Where, like, you know, I I put my phone away for an hour and a half, got some work done, and then you know, all of a sudden, I opened my drawer, and my brother is just texting me nonstop about what was <laughs> going on, and it was pretty surreal. Yeah, it's uh, it's. I mean, so, some of the imagery is like, it's, it, I mean, you know, they say like pictures, you know, resonate in your brain and, you know, much more effectively than words do. Like the, you know, barbarian Viking guy. Like I don't think I'll ever be able to unsee uh, that that image. I mean, just yeah. it is. Yeah, the one of the Capitol Police with, like, with those three Capitol Police with their guns drawn and someone trying to come through the, oh, yeah, the yeah, door. Kind of, yeah, that's, it's like out of a movie, right? It's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's it's sort of you put that up right there. Like I I thought about it wasn't quite 9/11 level surreality, but it reminded me of Columbine. If you had scripted this as an episode of some, you know, cable television show, uh people would have said no to the script for it being way too unrealistic. Yeah. Right? I mean, it is uh it's it's a remarkable moment in time. Um yeah, and, and I guess for what for what it is, at least we're not going to forget this. Um, yeah. So it's going to uh, make a pretty again. big uh, Sorkin script, I think. <laughs> yeah, we're getting there. All right, we are uh, five minutes over time. Everyone, thank you for joining us. We'll see you in two weeks. Please bring friends, family, colleagues to hear about the amazing trends we learn about on the twenty first. All right, happy New Year, everybody. Thanks all. Bye.